So welcome. This is uh, the panel on violence and delinquency in the late Third Republic. Um, my name is Joshua Cole. Um, I'm from the Department of History at the University of Michigan. And I'll be the chair of the session. And I will also be reading the paper for uh, one of our panel members, who I will introduce later, um, who couldn't make it to the panel. So uh, our first speaker today is Caroline Campbell. Caroline Campbell is an associate professor of history at the University of North Dakota. Her book, Political Belief in France, Gender, Empire, and Fascism in the Croix de Feu Parti Social Francais, came out with LSU Press in 2015. Her new book project explores the relationships between colonialism and fascism in France from the late 19th century through the Vichy, Vichy period. And her paper today is part of that project. The title is Colonial Violence in Paris, Fascism, Jean Ferrandi, and Colonial Officers of the 1930s. Carolyn Campbell. In Germany, on February 27, 1933, the Reichstag Parliament building caught fire and burned down one month after the Germans elected the Nazis to power. The Nazis and their allies used the Reichstag fire as an excuse to change the Constitution and suppress civil liberties, which drove Germany's transformation from a democracy to a dictatorship. The following month in France, a fascist newspaper published a dramatic image on its front, front page. It was of the French Parliament building, the Bourbon Palace, that housed the Chamber of Deputies, and it was on fire. Deputies hung by their necks from street lamps on the Concorde Bridge that crossed the Seine and led to the palace. The caption to the cartoon read, do we need to get to this point? The newspaper that published the cartoon was that of a group of veterans who were officers, the National Association of Veteran Officers, and I'm going to be calling them uh, the ANOC. The ANOC was led by a veteran of colonial warfare, Jean Ferrandi, who is also, uh, he also founded another group, the National Union of Colonial Veterans, and I'm going to be referring to them as the Colonial Veterans. My paper today seeks to show that Ferrandi stood at the center of a nexus of activists who constituted the fascist branch of the radical right. While Ferrandi and his groups are not well known to historians, I will suggest that they were influential. Both of Ferrandi's groups, the ANOC and the Colonial Veterans, cultivated anti-democratic sentiment that led to a turning point in the Third Republic, an insurrection on, uh, by the radical right on the night of February 6, 1934, which brought down the leftist government and instigated an era of political crisis. My paper's primary argument is that Ferrandi's influence was rooted in his distinctive approach to political organizing. Uh, he was trained in the ideas and methods of colonial conquest, and upon leaving the colonial army, he applied his training to political situations in France. So in this way, fascism in France was influenced by colonialism in ways that historians have yet to understand. So before discussing the interwar period, I'd like to talk about Ferrandi's life uh, as a colonial officer. He was born in 1882 in the Dordogne into a military family, and he graduated from Sancerre in 1905. He chose to enter the colonial infantry of the Troupe Colonial. He arrived in Central Africa in 1906, and he participated in the conquest of Chad, which was characterized by some of the most extreme violence anywhere in the 20th century French colonial empire. He initially joined a Mayor East uh, 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 platoon as a camel corps uh, that was used as an instrument of terror. Um, Ferrandi took command of the platoon uh, when he was uh, promoted to lieutenant, and he commanded it from 1907 to 1909. Under his command, the Mayor East conducted at least six razzias against the people of Chad. Ferrandi himself described the razzias as murderous assaults that killed people, pillaged herds, and cut off their wells. In an assault in 1908, Ferrandi's superior uh, described Ferrandi's actions in this way. Ferrandi drove the Marys vigorously and reached the wells of Arada, where they killed around 100 men, taking them by surprise. There are multiple quotes like this uh, describing Ferrandi's actions. By 1913, Chad had been conquered, and Ferrandi had been one of the top officials to help plan the conquest. He was a part of the general staff uh, of the general who, who, uh, who completed it. Um, the human costs of the conquest were catastrophic. 
Uh, in one part of Chad alone, the population decreased from around 700,000 in 1910 to around 400,000 in 1914. Historian Jean-Louis uh, Triot has shown that the 43% decline was due to the violence of conquest. The razzias and the dislocation of trade routes and food exchanges exacerbated drought conditions and led to famine. For Ferrandi, his eight years in Chad from the age of 24 to 32 taught him that quick, aggressive, and violent action brought about ideal political results. Going on the offensive is what allowed the, Chad, uh, what allowed the French to occupy Chad and extend uh, their Central African Empire northward. So as a point of comparison, uh, Ferrandi's commitment to offensive warfare differed uh, from an important case of colonial conquest that was happening at the same time, and that was in Morocco. Uh, there, the general in charge, General Leo Tay, uh, deployed violence in a different manner. He deployed it in more of a, retali a retaliatory manner. Uh, his goal was to seek uh, to persuade Moroccans to submit to, to French rule before uh, striking violently. Uh, to do this, Leote favored the use of slow-moving, heavy columns that occupied territory according to ethnographic research that was conducted by soldier scholars. One of uh, Leote's officers whose formative experiences were in Morocco was Francois de la Roque, and he was a future leader of the most important group on the far right in the 1930s, uh, the Quadifun, its successor, the PSF. So as we shall see, the different approaches preferred by Ferrandi and Laroque would have important consequences in the 1930s. When Ferrandi retired in 1927, he had reached the rank of lieutenant colonel and was well known in military circles. He was disgusted by the state of metropolitan political culture, uh, particularly the pacifist spirit of Briandism and what he believed was the chaotic state of French democracy. He thus involved himself in radical politics. He focused on writing, and his five books and numerous articles that he published between 1927 and 1932 glorified war and held that elites needed to reorganize the French nation. While Ferrandi prized what he called the value of the pen, uh, he also wanted to create structures that could mobilize military elites to lead France. In a book that he published in 1930 that was called The Colonial Officer, he wrote, Colonial conquest requires the brutal possession of a country. The role of the colonial officer is complex, but above all, we are combatants. Ferrandi believed that the broader veterans movement was too willing to obey the, the rule of law. He thus created the colonial veterans in 1931, um, and he wanted to try to mobilize colonial officers, and then he became president of the ANOC in 1932 to intervene directly into politics. Also in 1932, he was elected to the Paris Municipal Council, and he promised to transform the city governance at the Hotel de Ville. So these three powerful positions allowed Ferrandi to connect the world of colonial veterans, army officers, and politicians. He explained why his model of political organizing differed from other groups, specifically La Roque's Croix de Feu, which uh, had sought to create a mass movement. So Ferrandi said, it's the quality, the quality, in effect, that for us is more important than the number. Indeed, the colonial veterans leaders insisted that colonial officers were the authentic combatants because they had overthrown regimes and that they had suffered more than veterans who fought during the Great War. The colonial veterans' purpose, as they put it, was to bring the colonial spirit to France. Both of Ferrandi's groups acted as a bridge between colonial warfare and metropolitan part, uh, politics, the heart of which included transferring gendered and racialized hierarchies across contexts. For example, one of the most prominent colonial veteran members, uh, General Jean-Baptiste Marchand, uh, wrote this in the colonial, ve colonial veterans newspaper. He said, colonial veterans build a strong, sorry, colonial ve veterans build a bond among each other first and among uh, and against all forces of disorder, which are numerous and fearsomely influential. This bond is what the modern sons of Italy call fascism. The sons of France advance a formula identical in its effects, a united front. So in referring to the sons, Marchand transposed the hypermasculinity of Italian fascism to France. Indeed, the colonial spirit was one in which men acted as aggressive penetrators and pacifiers of new worlds, bringing order to disorder. In this vein, women were to follow men into the colonies, 
So for example, Ferrandi's wife, Lucy, spent time with him in Chad, and she led the Colonial Veterans Women's Section. One of, its, uh, one of the women's section's members explained the ideal gender hierarchy uh, of the Colonial Veterans in this way. She said, in the work of our great Colonial, we know a good many causes where the wife not only respected, but exalted masculine energy. The presence of European women was always a factor in the success of our civilizing work. She opened the doors of the harem, her tenderness and gentleness conquered hearts, and in the first hours of our colonial expansion, the home that she made became a place of calm and stability in the hours of clashes and agitation. While the colonial veteran's gender ideology was a rigid conception of separate spheres uh, that subordinated women's positions to that of men's, uh, the Anok was worse. The uh, officer veterans never created a women's group, and they asserted that women had one job, and that was to be mothers, and within that, their sole job was to teach their sons nationalism so that they could become soldiers. The members of the colonial veterans and the ANOC thus agreed that fascism meant that men would lead a united front against disorder. One of the colonial veterans' leading theorists who defined the sources of disorder was the group's co-founder, Jean Reynaud. Reynaud is well known among interwar historians as the leader of the fascist uh, Solidarity Francaise, or the SF. Uh, in 1937, Reynaud created the French Fascist Party, which shows that he accepted the fascist label. Reynaud had fought in Indochina, and he shared Ferrandi's vision for how to remake France along gendered, racialized lines. Specifically, Reynaud used uh, Charles Maurras's concept of the Métoc to racialize his enemies as anti-French, uh, and casted them as foreign interlopers on French soil. Reynaud's racializing of the enemy reflected broader sentiments. Uh, Francois Coty, for one, was a powerful financier of fascist groups. He worked closely with Reynaud and Ferrandi, and Coty wrote in his 1931 book that he called Save Our Colonies, uh, that quote, the Mongols of Genghis Khan left a permanent Asiatic imprint on Russia. Bolshevis Bolshevism is doubly Asiatic due to its Hebrew theorists and its recruitment of followers who nearly all belong to people who are Mongolized in Russia. Anti-Semitism and xenophobia were thus rife in the colonial veterans as it conflated Frenchness with whiteness. The group reached 10,000 members by the end of 1933 and its membership list shows that nearly all the names were European. Not surprisingly, people of color and Jewish people were not represented in the colonial veterans or in the Anarch. So this was the authoritarian, hyper-masculine, and racialized environment in which the Anarch produced the March 1933 cartoon of the Bourbon Palace Fire. More extreme than the cartoon was the group's invocation of Article 35 of the 1793 Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which justified insurrection against the state. Here's the text of Article 35. When the government violates the, right, the rights of the people, insurrection is the most sacred of rights and the most indispensable of duties for the people and for each portion of the people. So as far as I know in my research thus far, the ANOC was the only group to invoke Article 35's right to inter insurrection throughout 1933. Um, in January and early 1934, the language of insurrection spread to other groups. The issue of Anok's newspaper published on the eve of February 6th threatened to occupy the Bourbon Palace. It told its readers that they wanted to, quote, place machine guns on the roof of the Bourbon Palace, tanks in its yards, and police forces everywhere. On February 3rd, Ferrandi led a meeting of municipal councilors and Anok members at the Anok's headquarters. There, the president of the uh, Parisian Council proclaimed, he said, the hour is grave, the course of events characterize the beginning of a revolution. Ferrandi followed him and said, Parliament is more corrupt than the Hotel de Ville. The hour has come to make a clean sweep of the Augean stables. So a total of nine radical right groups participated in the events of February 6. They planned their marches to begin in spots that all together encircled the Bourbon Palace in order to converge on the Chamber of Deputies. The police and the gendarmerie set up barricades throughout the city in anticipation of the marches. Shouting to the chamber, many of the marchers made it to the Place de la Concorde, where they found themselves blocked by police barricades from crossing the Concorde Bridge uh, to the, the front of the Bourbon Palace. 
The worst of the violence would take place at Concord, particularly when the main contingent of Jean Reno's SF arrived at 7.30 that night. 2,000 quad of foes for the quad of uh, 2,000 of them marched on the Bourbon Palace from the rear. Uh, and its main column was actually halted at police barricades and LaRoque ordered them by telephone from his command center off-site uh, to withdraw. Uh, if LaRoque had been as committed to the offensive as Ferrandi, the night's events may have proceeded differently. But as for Ferrandi and his groups, they were some of the most active participants of the night. Ferrandi left the Hotel de Ville with several municipal councilors around 7.20 p.m. They were citing Article 35 and the right to insurrection, and their plan was to attack the side of the Bourbon Palace from the east by crossing the Seine at the Solferino Bridge, which is one bridge over from the Concord Bridge. Uh, uh, the municipal councilors led by Ferrandi, they joined a, a column of 1,500 uh, Jeunesse Patriot, or JP, and by the time they arrived at the Solferino Bridge, the column was led by the municipal councilors along with JP leader uh, Pierre Tatanger, and it had grown to 3,000, and that included the Anoc and the colonial veterans. So this column, they came upon a major police barricade at the Solferino Bridge, and they attempted to break through it. Violent clashes followed and injured up to 50 people, including Ferrandi, who reportedly had blood all over his face. So in this instance, unlike LaRoque, Ferrandi had engaged in a full assault on the barricade. Critically, the front of Ferrandi's column breached it, and a handful of men made it, made it through the barricade, um, but they were dispersed. So there, it was chaotic, and, and Ferrandi was separated from, other from the other municipal councilors. And he mistakenly made his way to the front of the Bourbon Palace, while the four others that he was with, the four leaders, ended up at the side of the palace as planned. Ferrandi had only a couple of supporters with him by this point. Uh, he was injured, he demanded to be let inside, but the guard at the front, uh, at the head of the barricade in front of the palace refused, and Ferrandi was arrested. Meanwhile, meanwhile, the counselors that he was supposed to have been with were admitted to the palace by a sympathi sympathizer inside the palace. Um, and then the mu municipal counselor counselors used their status as elected officials to force an audience with Prime Minister de Laudier. Uh, they demanded his resignation and promised that if he did, they'd call off the demonstrators, who by this point had amassed at 10,000 strong and caused at least five fatalities. Delatier refused and the counselors were escorted out. And then not long after that, about 10 p.m., the demonstrators at Concord launched a furious assault uh, that led to a prolonged period of combat between security services and demonstrators. Police finally cleared the square about 11.30 that night with a massive assault and cavalry charge. By the end of the night, 14 people were killed and over 2,000 injured and Delatier, for a series of, of reasons, resigned the next day. So as historians have pointed out, this was the first time during the Third Republic that street violence had brought down a democratically elected government. Uh, the Chamber of Deputies established a commission of inquiry to investigate the origins and causes of February 6th. It was led by a center-right politician, and the commission identified Anok's cartoon call to occupy the Bourbon Palace and its invocation of Article 35 is playing a key role in creating what they called a climate of insurrection um, that put the survival of the Republic in danger. Indeed, the Commission concluded that the fact that the participants believed that they had a right to insurrection was the most important aspect of the entire crisis. When asked by commissioners if his goal was to overthrow the government, Ferrandi replied, we certainly wanted to overthrow the government. Moreover, the commission concluded that the most important event of February 6 was when the councilors entered the chamber. The commission showed that this action was illegal and that it violated the premise of the republic by regarding the democratically elected chamber that represented all of France as illegitimate. Ferrandi was instrumental in providing the ideological justification uh, for the insurrection, and he acted as a liaison with troops on the ground, given his relationship with Reynaud's SF and Tatanger's JP. So as I mentioned, LaRoque called off his quad of troops, and so it is possible that Ferrandi could have done so as well. We don't know if events would have proceeded differently had Ferrandi entered the chamber with the other counselors as had been planned. 
What we do know is that Ferrandi played a central role in the political polarization that occurred after February 6th. He helped to unite several far-right groups into the National Front in May 1934, and that was followed by the formation of the anti-fascist Popular Front. The Anoc and the Colonial Veterans were central players in that nationalist coalition. A major holdout in joining the coalition was the Croix de Feu. So throughout 1934, Ferrandi met with LaRoque multiple times to try to convince him to unite the right. On the night of January 29th, uh, 1935, Ferrandi had attended a Croix de Feu meeting to, to do just this. LaRoque once again uh, refused, uh, and Ferrandi was supposedly filled with despair and anger, according to the police. He left the meeting, he went home, suffered a major heart attack, and he died. So, the fascist branch of the radical right had lost one of its primary leaders and that created a vacuum that they never filled. So to conclude, Ferrandi's originality and his influence lay in his ability to use ideas and methods of colonial conquest in Paris. So the ideas centered around a hyper-masculine celebration of war and a racialization of enemies, and his preferred method of warfare was quick, offensive, violent action, which was on display on February 6th. So under the guise of the right to insurrection, he attempted to lead his column to attack the Bourbon Palace and overthrow the government. And one wonders what might have happened to the fascist branch of the radical right had Ferrandi lived. Thanks.